here with Encino Mom TV, and today I am here at the Riviera 31 in the Sofitel Hotel in West Hollywood. And I am so excited to share with you this book, We'll Always Have Paris, and the author who has come up here from San Diego with her daughter. This is Jennifer Coburn. She's written this wonderful, wonderful book, and her daughter Katie. And over here we have Lizzie Kay, that's my daughter. And we're gonna just talk a little bit about this book that chronicles, it doesn't really chronicle, it talks about your experiences traveling together from the time Katie was eight. So welcome, welcome. Thank you so much, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Thank welcome. You, you wanna welcome anybody? Oh, well, welcome. welcome to you. <laughs> How did you come to write a book about your travels with your daughter? Well, it's actually my mother's idea. We were having uh, lunch together on Christmas Eve about two years ago, and I was telling her about when Katie and I were in Spain visiting the Alhambra in Granada, and we ended up singing uh, folk songs with a group of elderly Korean tourists, and she said Ooh, to me, I'm sorry, I, 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 just, I, know, I, just, I thought I just slipped that in. <laughs> no, wait a minute. So what, what kind of folk songs? Like uh, Hallelujah? Or no, no. Um, Korean, I, folk Korean, folk songs, Korean folk songs. Korean folk yeah. songs. We, and you both speak Korean? No, we speak no <laughs> Korean, actually. Um, that was kind of the only couple Korean words that I knew. When I was in fifth grade growing up in New York City, this uh, new girl showed up in our school, Jeannie Liu. She had just arrived from Korea. She didn't speak a word of English, and I have no idea why the teacher thought this was a good idea, but she brought Jeannie up to the class, the front of the class, every day and had her sing this Korean folk song. Oh we my would... gosh, could, but could you imagine? You know, it's a, your first day at a school in a new country and the teacher brings you to the front and tells you to sing, sing a song, song, right? And she every did this day? Every single day, so, okay. so it stuck. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. And then when we met these tourists, um, I, I, she asked me, uh, this older woman said to me, where are you from? I said, we're from San Diego. Where are you from? And she said, we're from Korea. And then I thought, I don't want to bring up politics and telling her how much I like Korean food seems a little ditzy. And then I remember Jimmy. And then I I'm said- I'm listening for this. I'm waiting oh, for this yeah. song. So, 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 so I said, oh, Korea. And you, you could hear the swish of 12 gray heads turning around in shock. And the woman said to me like, how do you know? Chapuri <laughs> And I told her about Jimmy and another a friend of hers said, why don't all of us women line up and sing the song together? And Katie had just uh, moments earlier kind of drifted off looking at some uh, flowers in the garden. And then she turned around at the sound of the music and saw the last thing she ever expected yeah, to that see. that was probably one of the weirdest moments of my life. I was like, oh, look, pretty flowers. Oh, I'm really enjoying Spain. I think it's funny they name those mountains the Sierra Nevadas also. And then there's my mother singing with a bunch of Korean tourists and doing a synchronized dance. But who joined in? Yeah. Who, who asked to join in? I wanted to feel tall. Don't judge me. Oh. <laughs> no, it was, it was magical. It, it was, was magical. That kind of thing is magical. I, it was very nice. It was just this moment that we had with strangers from across the, the globe. And yeah. the takeaway message for me when we uh, walked away was um, what my father had shared with me so many times growing up. He was a musician, and he always used to tell me that uh, music is about universal human connection. And Absolutely. I thought, Absolutely. Oh my God, that's what he meant. Absolutely, so. absolutely. So wait a minute, let's get back to your mom oh, at, the, yeah. at uh, Christmas Day at the Coronado. So <laughs> we, were, we were talking about our travel stories and she asked if I had ever considered writing a, a travel memoir. And I told her, no, I write, I write fiction, I write novels. And she said, well, maybe the story that you have to tell this time is your own. Well, you know, I, it's interesting. Um, I didn't know that about you, that you had written novels, even mm -hmm. though I probably read that in press releases and so forth, so forgive me. But when I read the book, I was so in that I didn't remember those details about you. And I felt that it read very much like fiction, even though I knew I could feel the, the, personal, true, the personal truth of the story. Thank you. But going back <clears throat> and forth between your experiences with Katie and your life 
as a young person with your own dad, mm-hmm. really feels like fictional characters. You know, feels crafted like a like a novel. Oh, thank you. So I think people that love fiction will love your book. I hope so. I think they will. <laughs> I'm telling everybody to read it, and so far they're all agreeing. Oh, <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Did you read the book? I did. I read every single draft because <laughs> she wanted to make sure she, I was okay with everything. What yeah. was it like, like actually being, you know, in a book and like having your story told? It was a little weird simply because it was a full length book, but my mom's been writing articles with me in them or about me since I think before I was born. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> it wasn't an entirely new experience, but. I must say, it was stranger to see her in a new light because I had lived through these trips with her, but I didn't know any of her internal dialogue. I think the most fun part for me was realizing, oh, you didn't actually know what you were doing. I (laughs) thought you did. I thought you actually spoke French. I know. I know. In the first chapter, um, we were in a cafe, and Katie asked me what, she pointed to something on the menu and said, what does this mean? And I thought, oh my God, this eight-year-old child has placed trust in me and really thinks that I know what I'm doing. And I don't. So I'm glad that you uh, only found that out eight years later. (laughs) Well, I think we have to talk about Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Okay. Right? Okay, yeah. I mean, you know. Yeah, I did write it. And And you know what? I almost didn't write about that. And my mother said to me, why would you not share that? And I said, well, it just, it's, um, it just, it was a bad parenting moment. And she said, are you writing a PR piece or are you writing something that you hope that people connect with because of the emotional honesty? And I thought, oh my God, I did the crime. Now I have to pay the time. Well, you know, it's interesting because you, when you hear Amsterdam, what do you think of? Mm-hmm. Right? You think of pot cafes. You mm-hmm. just do. And so, you could have left it out, mm-hmm. and we wouldn't have known. But we would have left. You would have left us with this question: like, really, they were in Amsterdam, and there's no mention of pot. There's this. Right. There's this great story about your dad and the connection. The connection that must have been amazing to find his music. Yeah. Oh, that was amazing. And if I had written it as a novel, I would have had us searching for days through the whole trip, and then at the end find it. But it it was really amazing how easy it was for us to um, to locate that uh, that record. I said to Katie, "Look for um, look for the record only a fool." And she said, "Do I look under Coburn or do I look under?" Bergen. I said, no, look under Mighty Sparrow. And she just picked it up and said, this Mighty Sparrow? And I thought, well, that took 30 seconds. Yeah, so. yeah. I, I got chills. I, again, I think this is another magical moment, you know, mm-hmm. really. Yeah, I, and the place was called Second Life Music. Right. Like, I know. Yeah, I, I, feel like, I feel like that was your dad. I feel like that was your dad going, I, I love would, you, I'm here, I see you. I would love to, I would love to think that as well. Some I know your husband would disagree with me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. My husband would say, the song was a major hit in Amsterdam, this was a second-hand book. Uh, second of course, hand. It, was of course it was there. Of course it was there. Of course it was under S for Sparrow. Um, <laughs> but there's a little part of me that, that um, holds hope that maybe, maybe this was my my pennies from heaven, my yeah. vinyl from heaven. Yeah. <laughs> so then, um, was it cake? It was. Uh, it was called space cake. Yeah. Space, space, space cake. cake. So should we leave them hanging and say no, you have well, to read? It? You well, want to no, say something? I'll, okay. I'll, we can. We can talk about the space okay, cake. So, okay. yeah, I, I. I finally learned just how long it takes for something to seem normal, which is four days. Um, <laughs> We walked, we walked through the streets of Amsterdam and we're like, wow, it really smells like pot all the time. Everybody's Everywhere. Everybody's walking around smoking. I'm like, is that, is that 90-year-old lady on the bike high? And <laughs> I'm like, she, she is. She's got a bomb on her, no, she, in her basket. Um, and, and after... After we saw this woman at a farmer's market who was holding a stroller with a toddler in it talking about recipes for um, spaghetti sauce with the weed man, um, I, I just, it just was, seemed very normal and, and I said, I think I'm going to get a little space cake and I'll have a little, I'll have a little nosh after dinner and I'm sure it'll be nothing. I'm sure it'll be just tourist 
um, just grade. a little, you know, tourist grade, right? Yeah. Like that lollipop we had. Not so much, you know, it was pretty. Hey, I, I said to Katie, the takeaway message from this is always listen to the drug guy. He told me half, uh, half of the cake yes. and wait an hour. I did not wait the full hour and, you know, my bad. If I had to do it again, <clears throat> I would have stopped at half. I just, I just, I just felt for you so much because oh. I was like, oh my God, what a, what a minefield to step into. Horrible. It was terrifying. In my defense, I will say I ate this cake knowing that the rest of the night we would be spending in a hotel and not driving and not doing anything too, we were doing laundry. As it turned out, laundry turned out to, to be, be too a much. really scary experience. <laughs> I, I actually proposed abandoning our clothes in the um, in the dryer because yeah, that it was, was too scary to go downstairs. That was about when I knew something was up. I was like, she would never abandon laundry. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, <clears throat> after the hour mark, I well, at the 55 minute mark, I was like, well, I don't feel anything. I guess this is just, you know, just kind of a, a just a nice little souvenir. Uh, but I am hungry. And then I ate the rest. And then when I hit the one hour mark, I started feeling like that sign that says I Amsterdam, I am Amsterdam. I love everybody and I love Amsterdam and my, 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 my lips are so warm. And, and then I thought, oh no, oh no. This I could ride out and I could probably, you know, not I could probably you could go, not go I, nuts. I could probably go go unnoticed. I mean, yeah. there would be a couple of you know observations that probably needn't be made. Like, like wow, that butterfly is so beautiful. I think my favorite was, what are lips? They're just fleshy mouth gaze. Yeah, yeah. Started, fleshy mouth. Fleshy mouth gaze. I started musing about what <laughs> lips were, but then at the two-hour mark, it was. Absolutely. Oh, um, because the second half of the brownie hit you. The second half you. kicked in. And then it became not just a groovy little Amsterdam trip, but a full-on... I was a cautionary tale. Katie says, I am never trying pot now because that did not look fun. And um, It didn't sound fun. It wasn't it didn't fun. Sound fun. It really wasn't. I was walking around the hotel room telling Katie I was going to walk it off. I was going to walk it off. And then if she hadn't sounded so terrified, it actually would have been hilarious because she just came up in the bed. And she's like, we got to snuggle it out. We got to snuggle it out. And then she would have swim it out, <laughs> swim it out. Oh, mm -hmm. my gosh. That I that know. would scare me, too. Um, to see my mom, you know, well, just like come yeah. unpeeled. But but I kept, you know, I. I, I felt so guilty. That was the worst part. Oh, I felt well, that's so always the worst guilty. part. Guilt, guilt is not that helpful. I know, I yeah. know. But she was, she was very helpful. And um, you know, Katie said, "All right." <laughs> I, I talked her through room service. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you actually order? You didn't want to get on the phone. I ended up ordering it, and then he walked in with the pizza, and he's like, "Oh, how's your trip going?" And she's like, "Get him out of here! Get him I out said, of here! It's going very badly." <laughs> <laughs> I know. I and then I told her to order cake, and then um, and then I told her, "Don't order the cake. He'll he's, know. Isn't he's gonna know." Oh yeah, <laughs> I remember that in the book. Oh. Because then he, he would think that you know they had the munchies right. they wanted. Mm -hmm. something. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. yeah, as if. Well, all I, you of don't the... have to know about this. You're twelve. You're twelve. So. I'm aware because I don't need to. Never mind. You know. The reason that I was in a rush to travel with Katie is because I was, I had a lot of fear about dying young, like my father. My father was 49 when he died. 49. And 49. I was 19 years old. And I thought, if I should meet the same fate, I want to jam pack Katie's mental scrapbook with beautiful memories of the two of us in Paris so that if I should die young, I can say to her very dramatically on my deathbed that we will always have Paris. I, I was hearing this new model of mother-daughter relationship. I feel like for centuries there's been this kind of um, normalized conflict that mm -hmm. we've come to expect mm -hmm. from mother-daughter relationships and it really excited the mother in me about the, the potential of being able to have a mother-daughter relationship that goes from all those beautiful moments of, of 
you know, being a, a new mommy through adulthood and still maintaining some kind of contact, you know? I'm All glad you, I'm glad you like that because that is one criticism that I have gotten on the book is um, that there was no conflict between Katie and me during our travels. I said <laughs> this this just doesn't seem um, realistic. Didn't you fight? Are you are you revising? And um, the truth is, we just never. We I expected to when we when we were planning our trip. I said, Katie, we're going to be together for a month straight we're going to get on each other's nerves and we're probably going to fight and we just didn't because when i was five she made me sign a contract that i wouldn't turn mean and i signed it in crayon and she still has it yeah oh so and i am legally bound by that contract <laughs> and her father's an attorney so right, it's so. clear i even got a notarized. i was gonna say <laughs> I really I applaud that and I I want to see more of that in the world I just think it's wonderful and I think it's entirely possible well I I think um, I think I got really lucky that I have a very reasonable kid it's I I can't take much credit for it I think Katie just is she's always been very very reasonable she's been um, somebody that I could negotiate with from a very very young age and, and she's been She's a lot like her dad, a oh, lot like William. So, are you um, are you good at negotiations? Would you say? Um, I'm relatively good at negotiations, though. Actually, growing up, it, my family has left me with one weakness in arguing because my parents are both very like relatively logical, reasonable people, and if I give them good reasons for something, they'll normally say, "Oh, okay, that makes sense. Sure." And then in the real world, that doesn't work as often as it should. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so. Because I think you're a really good negotiator. I think you could be an attorney. Yeah. I do. And I think what a lot of people really like about my mom's book is that there's something for everyone. Like some people have been writing about losing their parents at a young age or mm, wanting yeah. to travel, being a neurotic mother. Being a neurotic mother. <laughs> being a neurotic mother. Yeah, I've had a lot of neurotic mother mail. Oh. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, neurotic moms need to calm down. Well, I think they need to see that, uh, you know, they're not the alone and uh, <laughs> that some of their fears and anxieties are, are um, much more common than they think. I actually uh. learned that um, from the mail that I got from people who had lost parents, um, that fear of dying young is very, very common among people who lost a parent. Did not know that. Makes sense though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell us what's next. Are we going to make it into a movie? Oh, I would love Wouldn't that. Wouldn't that be great? I would love that. I want to make it into a movie. Well, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give you my agent's number after this. Okay. <laughs> I would love to see it as a Woody Allen movie, actually. I want to see it as a TV show. You want to see it as a TV show? Because I, I would like, like to see it survive. Spin. I had my first novel um, option for film, and that was 10 years ago. And The movie um, hasn't been made. It, you know, we went from, like, Katherine Heigl is going to star in it yeah. to it's Kate Hudson, and now it's like, can we... She can, hasn't been born yet, but as soon as she's born and she gets to the age that we need her to be, we'll call you. I know. Now <laughs> it's like we may do an indie flick in York. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Call me when, when it's time to film. Yeah, it's just, I, I, I think it's very, I think it would, you know, for me, this is, can I say this? I think, it, yeah, I can say it. I think it's better than Eat, Pray, Love. Thank you. In my opinion, I think that that book resounded with a lot of people. Um, I, this book is more well-written. <laughs> Sorry. I just, I, you that's not, what you, I think. You not have to be, it's funny because Eat, well, Pray... Well, I'm sorry to whoever that woman is. <laughs> Elizabeth Gilbert. She's doing fine. Yeah. I'm sure she's going to bounce back after. You think I'm not going to ruin her day? No, I don't. <laughs>that we may be in danger. And one ask. of them was our, our first night in Sevilla. And we sat down at a restaurant and this man came and we thought he was the waiter. He seemed like the waiter. He asked us what we wanted to drink. He asked us what he wanted to eat. And then he brought our food and sat down. And I thought, oh my God, this is so charming, the way the waiters sit down. And then after 20 minutes, it was like, he's not leaving. He's giving terrible service to the other um, tables. <laughs> and I, I still don't know what that was, if he was 
friend of the owner? Friend of, but but we we started. I started having these flashes of that movie uh, Taken with Liam Neeson, yeah. and I thought he's gonna kidnap us. Um, where I, and didn't you didn't you do something like you didn't tell where your yeah where your hotel was? Well, that's what but made you, us but nervous. But you played along with you know, like without. Without, uh, without, without even, without that. even, um, well, he started asking us all of the red flag questions, like where are you staying? What are your, well, what are your names is pretty reasonable. But then when he started asking where are you staying, how long are you here for? I thought, we are, we are in a scene from Taken right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, and and Katie and I just looked at each other from across the table, and she said, um, "Our dad, is, my dad, is back at the hotel <clears throat> cleaning his guns." <laughs> <laughs> and <clears throat> so, and then I was like kicking her under the table, like, "Don't pay with your credit card; you'll be able to see our names." Yeah. Well, that was actually very smart. They yeah, have very Thank smart. You. So, um, our our hotel was right across the street, <clears throat> so we had to find a way to walk around the neighborhood. And then when we saw him looking away, we do- we came, we went yeah. into the hotel, and we said to the concierge there, "Is this normal? Is this how?" Is this how you all roll in Sevilla, that waiters sit down for 20 minutes? And he said, no, this is very, very unusual. So I said, well, if he comes and looks for us, because I'm still thinking we're going to be kidnapped. And Katie now at this point realizes that her chocolate milk was unattended in his presence. And she yeah. was convinced that he slipped a roofie in there. And I thought, <laughs> maybe he did. So, so um, I drank okay. about two Neurotic. gallons of water. <laughs> so, yeah, she drank a lot of water that Don't night. I don't know why I thought that would help. So, <laughs> so then I said to this concierge, I said, if someone comes looking for us, you, we're not here. You've never heard of us. He said, Madam, I have never heard of you. Never. I don't know your names. So then my <laughs> husband called to see where we were. And and I, when I called him later that night, I said, oh, I better check in with William. Yeah. Let him know where it's he goes, oh, my God, I've been so worried about you. Where are you? I said, I'm in Sevilla. We're in Sevilla. And he said, I just called the hotel an hour ago. And when I asked for you, the uh, manager said that he's never heard of you. And he hung up the phone. <laughs> So, so yeah, that was. Remember that time we were in the nail salon? We were just in a nail. I was <laughs> just thinking that. What happened? So this man, he walks in and he's, you know, it's a bunch of nail salon, and you know, you know how the women are. They, you know, whisper about you behind your back. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, apparently they, you know, he's he's been the here only man a couple there, times, right? Yeah, and so he comes in, you know, and he wants his, you know, toes painted pink. So they're, you know, they're like, they're, you know, they're doing his nails and they're looking at each other like, you know, oh no, he's trouble. So then, you know, he gets finished and he sits down next to me. And so he starts talking to me and he, um, he shows me a picture of his girlfriend, which is, you know, what, you know how when you buy a picture frame, it comes with a picture. Oh. <laughs> so I was like, oh, she's, you know, she's very beautiful. And, and, I, said, and I'm sitting, I'm sitting there actually with the owner having my nails done, and Lisette <laughs> is waiting. So she's away from me, and yeah. I, I can't, you know, my, I'm being having my yeah. nails done. Like, I kind of can't move, yeah. and I'm just like, oh my <clears throat> god. Go ahead. And so, uh, so then he, you know, he's like, you know, I have a present for you, and he pulls out this pen. And it's um, it has those little beads attached to it, like he yanked it from the bank, you know, when you were writing a check. And he to me, I said, "Thank uh, you." And then um, she was so polite and poised. And he asked you. He asked me my birthday, and I said, you know, something like Jan- uh, January thirtieth, you know, something that like, it's not even, you know. And so then he goes, oh, me too. I was like, wow, what a coincidence. But he was so proud oh, of her wow. from across the room that you know. I had, I, I didn't have a remote control. There was nothing I could really do. I mean, obviously, if something mm-hmm. bad were to happen, nail polish would be on the walls. I would, I would have been there. But I was watching her just really handle mm-hmm. this situation and handle this man and just know not to tell him my birthday is blah, 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 mm-hmm. blah, blah. You know. It's good. We're lucky to be there with their first experience with creepers. Yeah. Don't be a creeper. <laughs> Don't do it. And you know, eventually the people came, he escaped something. He escaped his, you know, like he was... Oh, he was on an outing with like the 
Yeah, and he like ran away or something, yeah. and so they like came into the nail salon and like picked him up. Oh no, <laughs> they um no he went over to he was said he was gonna buy a car because there's oh. a car dealership right across the street. So we walked over there and then they you know they came in and they asked for him. We were like he's, he's buying a there. car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so thank much. You. This has just been delightful, and I just wish you every success with the book. Thank you so and much. thank you for living thank this you. book. Thank you. Letting it's your mom pleasure. write about it. <laughs> Thanks for watching. That's it for me today. I'm Lisa Keating with Encino Mom TV.